Welcome to Season 2 of SharePoint, as we continue to tap into the craft beer scene. I'm Jerry Hollow, your host. Today I'm talking with Christian Lakey and Aaron Carla from Silver Branch Brewing Company. Thank you both for being on the show. Of course. Thanks for being here. Let's start with your location. Many breweries are in an industrial park or similar space, but Silver Branch is in an office building. So share with our audience what went into that decision and then the challenges that presented. So we imagined that we were also going to end up in an industrial um, park somewhere just it just seemed like that's what happens because you need to have relatively low rent and you want to have a spot where you can get trucks in and out so a lot of things pull you in that direction but as we started to look we were uh, presented with this this location and immediately fell in love because our goal was always to share beer with our community mm -hmm. and so as soon as we realized there was the possibility of being able to open Silver Branch in a spot where we didn't have to make people travel to us, but we were essentially bringing, coming to them, mm -hmm. we immediately fell in love with the idea and just uh, worked with our landlord to make it work for us. I mean, kind of echoing what Christian just said, especially uh, with regards to community, like yeah. uh, I live in the community. I live maybe three blocks from here. Uh -huh. And so um, most of the breweries that I travel to or, you know, on weekends or when I have some time off, you know, it is some place that, you know, I've got to take an Uber to, uh, okay. you know, a part of town that looks like it's all, you know, warehouses from a 90s episode of Homicide. And then I uh, <laughs> show up to a uh, brewery that's mm -hmm. really lovely, you know, mm -hmm. so I really like being steps off the metro, mm -hmm. uh, minutes away from from where tons of people live right. and um, again it's like it uh, we get to be a center of the community mm -hmm. as opposed to having to bring people to us. Right. Well, What types of challenges did you have with it being in an office building? I mean structurally I think a lot of times people are in industrial parks because of you know got a lot of heavy equipment and you know things like that. I mean what did you guys have to overcome? A lot. <laughs> a lot really. I mean it's 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 crazy now two years on to remember back to the days that we were building this place out but uh, we took two different suites and combined it into one uh, combined area, which mm -hmm. is Silver Branch. Mm -hmm. One section where the brewery is located was three feet lower than the rest of it, just because we're on a hill. Okay. And so that's just the way that the building was constructed. That three feet was taken up by structural steel. So we oh. got 18, 20 foot deep um, I-beams delivered uh, and they had to weld them uh, between all the columns of the of the uh, existing space and then wow. pour a new floor on top of that. So um, there was a lot of work that went into making this place strong enough to um, to support a ton of liquid right. in tanks. Don't crush your neighbors yeah. below. So. Yeah, exactly. That's always right, my, right tank coming through, sorry. That's my worst <laughs> yeah. nightmare is like we've got a bank and a Dunkin' Donuts and other things beneath us and yeah. the idea that you know, somebody's going to come flying down on top of them is a, is a terrifying prospect. But so far, so good. We had good structural engineers working on it. So, uh, yeah, here we are. Absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, I came on probably two months before, two or three months before we actually opened the brewery. Uh -huh. uh, and I remember the first time I walked into the space was actually the day that I um, interviewed with them. And I was like, this is going to be a brewery and like soon, you know, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was basically a construction zone. Okay. Um, and I remember the first day that I walked into work and was like, this looks like a place that people are actually going to come. Yeah. You know, like, this looks like yeah. a place where it's going to be a community gathering spot. It's going to be a really nice uh, part of the neighborhood and mm -hmm. hopefully something that brings people to Silver Spring. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Oh, and it, it's just fun because it's a you know, 10 story tall building. And you wouldn't think that there's a brewery here, but people just love the fact that you know here in the middle of Silver Spring is a, is a brewery where not only do we uh, make beer, but we package beer. We've, mm -hmm. we've got vans going out uh, multiple times a week uh, for deliveries. And mm -hmm. so it's a production brewery tucked in the middle of a um, building in downtown uh, Silver Spring. I think people really enjoy that. When I was in Bamberg uh, a few years ago, they have seven breweries within the city limits. And I always thought that that is a really neat model to follow where you've got people you know, living and working and, and enjoying um, you know, going out all in the same, you know, same city block. And uh, so mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what we went for here and that's, here, that's what we made. Well, that's great. I mean, it segues nicely into the fact that your atmosphere here, um, it pays homage to the four major brewing cultures. You know, Germany, as you just mentioned, Belgium, kind of the British Isles, put UK and Ireland together, and then the United States. So talk about how these influences highlight the style choice that you make when you brew here? So I would say if we had one overarching goal with uh, most of our beers, it would be balance. Mm -hmm. Brett and I both, uh, my co-founder Brett and I both have always enjoyed the, the balanced 
classic beer styles of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got here uh, what's essentially an English summer ale slash bitter that we're releasing today. Um, Pilsner is one of our flagships. Um, we have a, a stout um, as well. And then an American IPA, um, which is not um, a hazy IPA, but rather sort of more of a classic take on an American IPA. And so in all of those cases, um, there are balanced beers that you can drink you know, two, three of, um, without feeling like your palate is being so saturated that you don't really want to take another sip. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I would say that that's really the, the foundation of what we were aiming for uh, with the, um, with Silver Branch. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not surprisingly, the beers that you think of when you think of the four major beer cultures, the beers that immediately come to mind are, you know, sort of the Pilsners and the, the balanced beers. And then they all have more extreme examples as part of the culture. So in, you know, if you're thinking about Central Europe, you've got your double box. If you think about the Americas, you've got your hazies and your double or triple IPAs. Mm -hmm. um, Belgium, you've got your quads and so on and so forth. So right. we knew that we always wanted to have that be part of what we do mm -hmm. um, because as a part of those cultures, but the mainstays of our of our beers are really the, the balanced um, beers that you just sit down and enjoy with friends and, and you know don't necessarily have to ruminate over, but they're, enjoyable enough that if you do want to ruminate mm -hmm. over them that they're worthy of that as well. Right. Well, you also, uh, your name kind of takes something from a, a little bit of those cultures and things too. Tell us a little bit about, there's a little bit more behind the name that just maybe people realize. Yeah, so we, we had a different name originally, which we lost uh, due to a trademark challenge, um, which was kind of a crushing blow, but in the end it ended up being a bit of a blessing because I think we're much happier with Silver Branch now than we would have been with our original name. Mm -hmm. So when Brett and I started brainstorming what that new name is going to be, it was a painstaking process. Um, and in the end, we ended up going with Silver Branch, like you said, because um, Silver comes from Silver Spring, mm -hmm. but the branch um, is a reference to an old uh, European tradition, which is true in both uh, Central Europe and in, in the British Isles. So I don't know if it's a Celtic tradition or what, but um, they used to hang a branch out when they had beer for sale. Mm -hmm. And so back in the days when alewives would be making the beer, um, they didn't maybe always have beer, and so when they did, they would they'd hang a, a branch out. Mm -hmm. And this continues to this day in, in southern Germany. They have what they call Basenwirtschaften, where they hang out brooms, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that indicates that they have the new wine. Oh. And so there's actually a period of time in Germany where they are legally allowed as households uh -huh. to sell this new wine, and they make food in their households, and so they have this uh, this continue to this day. So the broom, uh, the branch in our mind uh, is a symbol of hospitality, of come share a beer with us at Silver mm -hmm. Branch. And then we also like the fact that there's a lot of roads around here, you know, Piney Branch, mm -hmm. um, um, okay. Broad Branch, and a Muddy Branch. There's just a lot of roads, something branch. Yeah. Um, and they, I guess they refer to streams. Um, so mm -hmm. it just seems to be something I haven't seen anywhere else in the country. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a local connection as well. That's yeah, cool. and I mean, Christian's kind of talking about like on one of my favorite things about Silver Branch is kind of this beer education piece. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've always drank beer. I've always really enjoyed beer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, stuff like learning that, you know, they put the branch out when beer is for sale. Or even just, again, the styles that we brew that you just touched on. Yeah. Um, like right now I'm drinking Mondo Mundo, which is our Mexican style Vienna lager. Okay. And, you know, I've had like commercial examples of this mm -hmm. uh, many times, but I did not know kind of how Vienna lager came to you know the Americas and mm -hmm. came to North America and came to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so it's really cool for me to um, kind of like learn about these different styles, where they came from, and work for a brewery that has more of a like global focus as opposed to here's 14 different uh, yeah. <laughs> here's 14 different IPAs and I'm sure that they're all delicious. But right. you know again, uh, it's that education piece. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Well, also uh, a little bit more of the German influence. Uh, you guys have a really nice outdoor beer garden at Upsell Town. And then also that you were constantly trying to create this sense of Gemütlichkeit. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that. Well, I would say that the uh, Gemütlichkeit is really a, um, it, it's similar to the putting the branch out. It's okay. essentially, as I referred to earlier, we wanted to share beer with our community. That was um, really the, the underlying um, concept behind opening Silver Branch. And mm -hmm. so um, this idea of explore your world, experience the Gemütlichkeit, um, that's what we wanted people to think of when they thought of Silver Branch. So for beer cultures, um, balanced drinkable beers, mm -hmm. come out with a friend and, and, and have a couple beers. And uh, so just to take a step back, Gemütlichkeit is a German term 
for a sense of coziness and camaraderie um, and belonging that you get when you're in a spot that you feel like it's just where you're supposed to be. Uh, right. It's just a place to hang out with a friend and just to get this sense of warmth and, and, and welcoming. And so that's really what we wanted. We wanted people to come out here and just uh, share a beer with us and, uh, and have a good time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's it, it, you know, sometimes um, craft beer can be received a lot of different ways, but we really wanted it to be this sense of, of just enjoyment. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of funny that we're talking about Gimutlikite because I feel like that's like been this spelling word, you know, that I put in all of our <laughs> social media posts and have to use all the time. And actually, um, again, when I was interviewing for the job here, my brother is from Germany. Okay. I'm sorry, my, not my brother, my brother-in-law okay. is from Germany. And I was like, how do I pronounce this? Because I don't want to butcher it. And, right. you know, knowing me, I'm sure I got nervous and absolutely butchered it, you know. <laughs> Thank you, C- minus public school. School uh, German uh, oh. in high school, but um, yeah, um, again, it's a spirit that I think permeates everything that we do here. Um, again, from like our tap room service, mm -hmm. and you know, having people discuss beer with you, talking about the beer, talking, you know, trying to foster the, again that sense of coziness, but as well as like the styles of beer we brew. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, all the beers that are on this table right now are beers that are, you know, best enjoyed uh, in multiples with friends mm -hmm. uh, in a very like convivial environment. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Absolutely. Um, well, Christian, you did an apprenticeship in Belgium earlier in your brewing career. So uh, share with us those experiences and then how they helped shape you as a brewer. Well, that was an amazing experience. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough that uh, I worked at an organization where after for f working there for five years, we got 10 weeks sabbatical, which was essentially a vacation. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I met there and had a baby boy. And so we took our sabbatical um, and she was kind enough to let me uh, take the family to Belgium uh, mm -hmm. so I could work with some local breweries to really explore the question of whether I wanted to follow my dream of going pro mm -hmm. um, or not. Mm -hmm. So I wrote to many breweries in Belgium and heard back from one, yeah. um, uh, uh, Jean-Louis Diet, uh, who is the owner of um, Brasserie Avapour. And he invited me to come and, 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 and hang out and help him um, in his brewery. And when I was there, he then uh, set up day long apprenticeships or you know just visitations at a bunch of other local breweries. So mm -hmm. I got to go to places like Saison Dupont, um, Blogy, um, Silly, and a couple other breweries just mm -hmm. to get a sense of how bigger breweries operated as well because his was quite small. Uh -huh. And I just fell in love. And when I realized that brewing commercially was really not any different from brewing at home, except we have better tools and you make <laughs> more at once. Um, but conceptually, it was not different. Mm -hmm. I was really sold on the idea. So for me, that was a big turning point. It took many years after that before I was able to financially and for multiple other reasons make the transition. Sure. But, um, but yeah, that for me was a, was a great experience. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, now, you mentioned Bamberg earlier in Germany. The uh, you know, most breweries per capita and mm -hmm. has a rich history there. Um, how, did you actually get to spend some time there as well? I mean, because clearly that would be influencing, you know, your, your beer. I didn't. I've lived in Germany and that has influenced my gotcha. perception of beer a lot. But mm -hmm. um, I had a friend who got married in Switzerland. And oh. so I went to his wedding and just made a pilgrimage to, to, to Bamberg um, for mm -hmm. the Rauch beer and uh, to visit Weyermann Maltings. Um, I guess I was working for Gordon Biersch at the time and we used all Weyermann malts. Mm -hmm. So I got a tour of the Weyermann facility wow. and just uh, got to experience the beer culture in, in Bamberg and it was, it was great. That's great. Well, it sounds like those two experiences in particular, um, you know, really not just shaped you as a brewer, but maybe shaped what the Silver Branch has done in the direction that you've gone. So those are the things that are why you kind of use some traditional brewing techniques that maybe other places don't. Yeah, I think, I think for me, it's the beer culture and the process of making beer mm -hmm. has always been as appealing as, um, you know, drinking beer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I love seeing how the local water chemistry, um, cultural underpinnings and festivals and everything really create a beer as much as, um, you know, as much as taste. I mean, it's, it's interesting how these things come together over the years. So you've got traditional beers in a certain spot because of underpinning concepts of taxation, water chemistry, you know, uh, invasions from another place um, mm. and th things like that. So the history of why local beers are what they are for me is fascinating. And then from the time I started homebrewing in college, the process of, of taking these ingredients and putting them together and then having yeast to turn them into beer 
that almost alchemic um, process is just so fascinating that, that uh, as I said, that that's for me as appealing as the actual process of drinking it. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that I've had a chance to live abroad and, and see um, beer um, consumed in, in Britain, Belgium, uh, Germany, Africa, other places, wow. and just the kinds of things that are um, available in different places and why, for mm -hmm. me, it just led to this idea that we should have a place that celebrates beer as it's presented in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So even coming down to our glassware and the look and the feel that we tried to accomplish in our tap room, that's all influenced by the way that beer is enjoyed in different mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. And it's actually something that extends to, uh, you know, the events that we do here as well. Uh -huh. uh, we are actually getting ready to, um, you know, throw a huge Kolsch party here where in which like Kolsch is presented in the States the same way that it is presented in Germany, mm -hmm. um, you know, of uh, walking around with the trays and basically telling the server you know when you're when you're done Ooh. as opposed to you know having to flag somebody down and order a beer okay. and um, again like you know with the education piece with different beer styles how beers are made um, I feel like my knowledge about beer has come a long way but uh, being able to spread that to the community and show um, how things are presented differently in different parts of the world is really very cool absolutely yeah absolutely um, well, let's tap in a little bit more because it's, it's a great opportunity for our audience to learn more because you have so much experience, Christian. Um, can you talk about some of these you know, traditional brewing techniques, things like uh, decoction or you know, why you would use a multi-step mash or you know, the process of reverse osmosis with water, like why those things are important that you do them here and maybe other breweries don't? Well, that's a great question because it comes back to what I was just saying, that the, the local chemistry and traditions do inform why different beers are popular in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And so starting with the last thing you said, the reverse osmosis, Pilsner was invented in, in Czech Republic, um, you know, in, in Pilsen, mm -hmm. uh, hence the name Pilsner. Right, right. Um, and uh, it was a kind of a cross section of a, a brewery who was, I mean, a, a brewer who came from uh, Germany slash Austria um, with some techniques, and, but then used those techniques to make a beer in, in Pilsen where they have incredibly soft water and they have um, you know, local malts and, and, and uh, hop cultivation that had gone on for a very long time. So mm -hmm. they had you know, very, very high quality ingredients. And it was right around the time that um, technology had increased to the point where it was possible to make really inexpensive, very pale malt mm -hmm. and glass containers to serve that beer in. So all of these things together made it possible to make a light colored beer and to see that and appreciate that light colored beer in a glass. And so it, everything came together at once um, to make mm. what we now know of as being Pilsner. Okay. So uh, you have a, a brewer who came with the techniques and the ingredients to make uh, this, this brand new beer in the 1880s uh, that took over the world. Mm -hmm. And so in order to emulate that beer with our Czech Pilsner, Czech style Pilsner, which we call Glass Castle, mm -hmm. we needed to put, install a reverse osmosis machine oh. uh, so that we could make very, very soft water that would emulate that incredible hop flavor, but without the, um, you know, there's a, there's a different character of bitterness you get from soft water versus harder water. And the, more, mm -hmm. the harder the water, the more bracing uh, the bitterness is. So uh, Pilsner, Czech style Pilsner is a very bitter beer, mm -hmm. but it is a very soft bitterness. And so in order to get that character, we needed to install a reverse osmosis uh, machine, uh, which we use for all of our water, but then for our beers like bitters, we'll add a lot more salts into the water in order to okay. emulate okay. the water chemistry uh, that you would find in Britain, for example. Um, for our Czech style Pilsner, we do use all imported Czech malt. Mm -hmm. And um, that's more or less what we've done for all of our beers. Uh, for the British beers, we use uh, Maris Otter malt from, um, from Britain. Mm -hmm. More and more, we're trying to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. So we're exploring using English and uh, continental style malts made closer to home. Uh, there's a local maltster called Proximity Maltings out in Delaware. And they do a very good job. They've brought in European seed stock and they work with the farmers to keep the fertilization levels down so the nitrogen levels are, I mean, the protein levels are lower in the mm -hmm. grain. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to, trying to find the right malts for our beers. And if we have to import them, that's, that's, that's okay. We're, we want to remain that, um, 
that true to the style, but where we can find them locally, we, we, we like to do that as well, just for, for environmental reasons. Right. Well, I mean, that's great to hear. I mean, for me to learn more about, you know, the process that you do. Um, I have come from Czech heritage. My grandfather is from the Czech Republic. And so, uh, you know, that's something that I can now appreciate. Like I knew when I had Glass Castle that it was different than other Pilsners that I'd had. Um, but now to understand why and the process that goes behind it, it's, it's really neat. It makes me appreciate it even more. And the fact that you put that much care into, you know, trying to really replicate a style true to, to what it was meant to be. Yeah, and we, we, we also um, use yeasts that we think are appropriate to the different styles. Mm. Um, so for our English style beers, we've uh, decided on Fuller's uh, yeast as being our, our primary yeast. Okay. And one that um, I'm actually really uh, passionate about is Kolsch. Uh, mm. That's one mm. where uh, the right yeast is really a defining characteristic of that mm. beer. You know, it needs to be very light bodied, very drinkable and crushable in any case, but um, it needs to have a very distinct yeast character that you really get only from that, you know, that Kolsch yeast. And so um, mm -hmm. we, we use a, a Kolsch yeast for that beer, and we, we, as we do for all of our beers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw my eyes light up. That is my favorite beer that we produce every single year. Okay. And um, I'm extremely excited for it to return. <laughs> That's awesome. So, well, I mean, you brew, we've talked about it, but you brew a, a large variety of, of styles here at Silver Branch, but uh, let's kind of keep with the clean, classic styles and, and talk about last year's Great American Beer Fest, yeah. which was held virtually, uh, but you're beyond the known world, uh, won a gold medal it in is. the classic Saison category against 79 other entrants. Uh, it's very exciting. So tell us about that experience and then what is done for Silver Branch's brand. Um, well, I'll, I'll just jump in with an anecdote. I found out about that gold medal uh, the, um, the Friday before we got married. We got married here, actually, on a Sunday. Cool. Brett Robeson, uh, actually, who is, um, you know, the part, uh, Christian's co partner, uh -huh. co-founder, uh -huh. uh, he performed the ceremony. Oh. So it was very, very cool. Um, but we were out at dinner, and my phone just started blowing up. And I was like, oh, no. What happened? <laughs> Problem in the brewery. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I looked down, and it was, um, you know, we had won a medal at yeah. the Great American Beer Festival, and it was a bunch yeah. of people tagging us um, mm -hmm. cool. on social media, saying, like, congratulations, Silver Branch. So then it was like, Wow, uh, what did we win in uh, which medal, what category? Because I remember, um, you know, we even sent things in. I think we even had to overnight them. Yes, uh, you know, because it was like, what do we want to send? And so, like, we were just standing up here at the, it was like me, you, and maybe James mm -hmm. standing up here at the bar being like, okay, here's a box. Let's put them in and let's ship them off, you know? And, like, I think that none of us ever really thought again well i mean there's so it. many so many good beers you just yeah. i mean you obviously hope but the chances of winning are just so yeah. so, so small um, there's just so many good beers out there uh similarly i had um i found out in this in the same way that you yeah. did that i had just finished a long day of double brewing and it's finally wrapped up. I uh, was driving home and my phone started lighting up. I yeah. had completely forgotten, forgotten that the results <laughs> were coming out. Yes. And so uh, I was like, oh, what's going on here? And then, oh my gosh, we got the amazing news. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was fantastic. And coming back to my apprenticeship in Belgium, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, to some extent attribute it to that because um, the part of Belgium where I was working is the part of Belgium where the saisons are really, a lot of those are made. Mm -hmm. So I went to, I got to spend a day at Blogy, um, at Dupont, which is actually my opinion of a gold standard Saison. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, and that's really the, the, the inspiration behind the recipe for Beyond the Gnome World is uh, all Pilsner malt, uh, Sots hops, and get out of the way of the yeast. Let the yeast uh, you know, carry the load mm -hmm. um, because that's really the defining um, flavor profile of the beer. So go for a little fruit, a little pepper, um, you know, let that, uh, you know, that, that nice, uh, slightly grainy Pilsner um, malt uh, shine through. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, really, it's, it's meant to be um, just a balanced, easy drinking, um, pleasurable beer. Um, and I like the fact that it's just slightly sub 5% alcohol, so mm -hmm. you can have two or three mm -hmm. of them and, and still be good to drive home. Yeah. And right now, it's at the Matt's Ballpark. Um, we're, That's awesome. Yeah, so we got a picture uh, from a friend yesterday um, of him drinking a Beyond the Known World at the Nats uh, Park, so See? that feels really good. That's obviously a great way as you like, well, how did this impact the brand? Because, I mean, you guys are just barely over two years old, and to have that kind of accomplishment acknowledged is awesome. But like you said, it pays off of all the study that you did over in Belgium, and then to have it on a big national stage like that for baseball, that's fantastic. Also, it's just a great beer to drink while watching baseball. It's, you know, it's yeah. refreshing. Again, like Christian just said, relatively low gravity, so it'll last you through nine innings without, uh, you know, 
without you forgetting that you're at the game. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The finish is incredibly dry, so I find when it's really hot outside that really generally speaking, I don't want that sticky, you know, uh, your mouthfeel you have after okay. a bigger beer. Yeah. Um, but the fact that it finishes as dry as it does, it's almost champagne-like uh, mm-hmm. in that, you know, you just, you want you want another sip afterwards. So uh, when it's full summer, I think it's going to be very popular down there. Awesome. And one thing that's worked out fantastic um, for us is that we had a flagship for all of the other three brewing styles at that point in time. Mm-hmm. We had opened thinking that wit beer was going to be our flagship style for uh, the Belgian family, uh-huh. but um, you know we're up against some stiff competition in the form of Optimal Wit in this uh, yeah. in this area. It's yeah. an amazing beer, and um, you know it's, it's taken a lot of the place. And then of course Allagash White is, is national the other players. Thing. So yeah, b- exactly. Between Blue Moon, Allagash White, and Optimal Wit, mm-hmm. the market was pretty well saturated. saturated. Sure. So sure. we found that that brand didn't take off for us as well as we had hoped it would. And then when we won the medal, we thought to ourselves, well, this might be the um, the opening we need to make a Cezanne, which is a style that not many people know um, well enough to immediately reach for it. Uh, but we thought this might be a, an opportunity to, to get people to know it well enough that it becomes a local favorite. So right. we're, 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 we're hoping that'll happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And what's kind of fun about our Cezannes is, um, you know, we've become kind of like, like regionally known uh, for using gnomes on our label, mm-hmm. which is uh, definitely a nod and a tribute to a chief uh, in Belgium, who, of mm-hmm. course, you know, famously uses gnomes on their label as well. Right. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, you know, yeah. particularly as a marketing person here, is that, you know, the, the gnomes have become quite popular. Yes. So maybe talk a little bit about the gnomes and, and what okay. they've done for you. <laughs> our gnomes are awesome. We have a really brilliant uh, artist who does Absolutely. our labels, Chris mm-hmm. Bunnell. Uh, he does everything, but he kind of uh, created these gnomes. And I think actually the first label we used them on was Metronome, mm-hmm. which is one of my favorite labels, uh, just cool. because like it really ties in DC. Yep. It is gnomes on the metro, but it's also like gnomes on the metro looking like bored people on the metro. Like they're yeah. reading, they're looking at their phone, mm-hmm. they're looking out the window, you yeah. know. And it's, so it's like it's a very cute label. Actually, we do have posters for sale here in the brewery. Cool. <laughs> That's <laughs> cool. Little plug. Like, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I gotta get it in there. For sure. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah, but uh, you know, it's since like the gnomes have gone on tons of adventures. Uh, you know, beyond the gnome world, of course, the GABF uh, gold medal winning beer. You know, they are uh, being explorers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we did gnome for the holidays, which was of course a holiday themed uh, label. Um, Nature. Nomenclature, which kind of was a um, Albert Einstein uh, inspired yeah. <laughs> gnome. No, Nomageddon. Nomageddon. Which, uh, with, uh, with Oliver with Brewing. Oliver. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then, uh, um, all My Nomies. All My Nomies That's cool. yeah. is uh, a very delicious beer. And again, it, you know, it's kind of an interesting style because that, that one's a West Coast Saison. So it's a oh, kind cool. of a, uses West Coast hops in Saison yeast, am yes. I correct? Yep, yes. That's right. mm. um, and so uh, I really love it. But, um, you we're know. We're a little worried we're going to run out of gnome puns at some point. We don't know what we're going to do. We'll need to <laughs> bring in Melinda. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> there will never uh, never be enough gnome puns. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, that's, that's really exciting to hear, you know, about that, that recognition for you guys. Um, you know, that in that same GABF, uh, another one of our past guests, Zach Russmiller, who's at 1623 Brewing up in Eldersburg, a little closer to where I am, um, you know, they won in the American Fruit Beer category, which is a little unusual for them because he's a clean classic styles guy like yeah. you are. Right. I mean, He's got a number of uh, GABF, gold and silver medals, World Cup medals, things that competitions for Hefeweizens and Pilsners. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when we, we interviewed him in the past, he really kind of got me excited about going back and appreciating the clean classic styles. And, uh, and with, you know, that really being something you guys do really well, kind of selfishly of hoping at some point there's going to be a 1623 Silver Branch Clean Classic Styles collab, oh, yeah. you know, because yeah. I was like, let's put these two medal winning brewers together and come with some really outstanding classic beer. So. That sounds like a good idea. We, yeah. should, uh, we should look into that. That would be cool. That would be awesome. Um, well, we've all been forced to adapt uh, based on COVID. Um, you know, we had to shoot remotely for the second half of our season. Uh, talk about the various pivots that you guys had to go through and then how you managed to have a really great celebration for your second anniversary this past yeah. March. Yeah, it's been a crazy <laughs> year, uh, now more than a year. Um, yeah, we had our first year anniversary party, fantastic party celebration. And then I think it was two weeks later that we I think it was had a week later, something, something yeah. shockingly soon after that, that we mm-hmm. had to shut down. 
uh, due to COVID. And um, so as our accountant said recently, so you had one year to try to stand up the business and you had one year to try to survive COVID. I wonder what's going to be your third, third year is going to be like. So we're hoping that it'll be less eventful than either one of those two years. Right. Uh, or if it's eventful, it's eventful. At least in, in a good way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we did, we were lucky enough to have a canning line uh, from the time okay. we opened. So it was a you know, starting level canning line, but we had a canning line. When COVID hit, that was huge because mm -hmm. all of a sudden draft beer sales plummeted. Right. Nobody could go out. Right. And so at the same time, canned beer demand you know, rose you know, in, in, in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. So we had the ability to stop kegging beer and put all of our beer into cans. It mm -hmm. took a lot of labor, but the PPP loan kind of took care of that. Okay. So we got a PPP loan. We threw people at the canning line, we canned all of our beer, uh, and then we also got an EIDL loan, an emergency uh, disaster uh, loan from the, from the government, okay. uh, which is a 30 year low interest loan. And we used that to buy a better canning line uh -huh. and to increase our capacity. Mm -hmm. So we kind of took the approach where we ran at the problem as opposed to running away from the problem, just mm -hmm. figuring that we would try to do more. Mm -hmm. um, and um, with the government assistance, we were able to do that. And uh, that's that's really been our approach. So now we actually ended up brewing more beer um, at the end of the uh, COVID year than we mm -hmm. did at the beginning, okay. uh, which was a really exciting place to be. Um, and uh, the biggest the biggest challenge I would say is the inability to sell beer over the bar and you know at retail prices. Right. I mean that that's that's the part that I would say the was biggest the biggest challenge. Right, there. right yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So luckily, in the middle of the COVID summer, uh, you know, the outdoors was open again. Uh -huh. So even though we couldn't serve beer inside, mm -hmm. we did have a large uh, beer garden, like you mentioned earlier. Yeah. So that was huge. Um, and then the winter time was really just a matter of selling as much as possible in cans, both in home delivery mm -hmm. and in, in by via um, to, to retail stores. Mm -hmm. So that's that's another area I didn't mention, which is the other way that we ran out the problem was by uh, beginning to do home delivery. We opened a home delivery aspect to the business and, and of course, pickup, which had been yeah. which we had done before that. But mm -hmm. we added wine, we added cocktails and we added home delivery. So now, uh, even though we have the tap room open again, I mean, the tap room and the beer garden open again, we're still doing home delivery. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just sort of a new aspect of the business. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it was pretty much just try to give people opportunities to purchase over branch beer any way that they possibly can and uh, expand what's what's available to them in any way that we can. So we did uh, food delivery and food okay. to go as well. Mm -hmm. Pretty much any way we could sell something to somebody, yeah. we did. Yeah. Flour, yeast, yeah. toilet paper. That was, a, that was a Christian initiative, yeah. I mean, tying on to everything you just said, um, one of my favorite things about Silver Branch is the we're going to take this and run with it mm -hmm. and you know don't be wrong make smart decisions but uh be bold right. um like i think it was in april maybe or may of last year it was shortly after the beginning of the pandemic brett looks at me and is like we need to like we're gonna make a website like we are going to make an online ordering system and we we work with a wonderful guy over at digital link named jason unger who helps us with our website mm -hmm. uh so basically it was a ton of web development mm -hmm. basically uh with the goal of make people able to order from their homes, make mm -hmm. people able to get delivery or pick up or whatever they want. Um, and it was this it was this huge project that I think has really worked out super well for us. Mm -hmm. We are able to sell whatever we are legally able to sell mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. get it to people. I mean, because like really the end goal is always get the beer in people's hands, you right. know? Um, right. But again, pushing pushing it with things like Food to go, pushing it with things like uh, cocktails to go, you mm -hmm. know, um, it's it's a winning combination and you just have to, you know, try it and see what combination of things uh, you can make work for you. Right. And one thing that uh, I am eternally grateful for is the fact that the community really, really supported us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm sure that they enjoyed the beer that they ordered, but I'm convinced that a fair number of people who ordered ordered because they wanted us mm -hmm. to, to survive. make it. Absolutely. And so um, it, that is, it's just, it, it's hard to overstate how that, how mm -hmm. much that has affected us. I just, it, I'm so thankful for it. Well, I yeah. think that just is proof that you were able to create the environment that you wanted, that sense of community, that sense of connection, uh, that the people felt that and you know, wanted to make sure that you survive. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we also introduced a membership club last okay. year called the Explorers Club, um, which basically is kind of, um, you know, 
pay a yearly fee and you get, you know, a couple six packs per month. You get discounts on all of your taproom purchases as well as uh, now online purchases. Um, and again, it's called the Explorers Club. Mm -hmm. It's open now currently on our website. But okay. uh, it became like a really great way to um, kind of make the pandemic a lot smoother for us. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, right. people in your community who have a vested interest in seeing you survive because they love the brewery, they love the beer, mm -hmm. uh, they love having a place to, to come to, you right. know? Uh, and so it's, uh, I think that was another thing that really, that we did during the pandemic that really worked out very well for us. Mm -hmm. We are still not allowed to have a big celebration, you know, but uh, we do look forward to that uh, so that we can bring all the Explorers Club together yeah. for, a, for a big thank you party to yeah. all of them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, my whole my whole like life is planning big parties and events <laughs> right. and like having fun. And, uh, you know, uh, the fact that like I'm now starting to ramp back up in that department yeah. just like fills my heart with joy absolutely yeah. yeah well again it's great that your community stepped up and really that mm -hmm. not just that you were able to survive but actually able to thrive right. um and again we, we just we talked about zach earlier 1623 they had a similar situation they opened you know a week before everything went down, oh. you know, no. we, so they were barely open, oh. and then <laughs> boom, they got shut down. And, uh, so and then I just, so I just saw recently in the news where um, you know they've been able to you know thrive as well to the point where they are expanding. They're going to have another eight thousand square feet put in for more production and uh, more space to do some different things. And their distribution has really expanded into parts of you know Virginia and Pennsylvania and Maryland. So so you know just recently finding out that they've been able to really expand and thrive as well like you guys and again clean classic styles mm -hmm. we got to get you guys together yeah. <laughs> and do a yeah. little curl up um, well again you, you talked about the challenges and uh, I'm a big ancient history mythology fan particically Greek mythology so Sisyphus to me yeah. is a great you're my, story you're my target audience <laughs> I know and I'm so excited because I think I will share with our audience because it has a really special place in the history of Silver Branch but even more so with who knew the pandemic was coming but it seems so much more appropriate now uh, so yes. talk about that I'm glad you picked up on that because the process of getting Silver Branch opened um, <laughs> was really much more of a Sisyphean task than I really ever dreamed it would be mm -hmm. um, and uh, obviously, you know the story, but for people who don't, Sisyphus was a Greek um, uh, character in this myth where uh, he was required by the gods to continually roll this boulder up a mountain. Every time he'd get to the top, the boulder would roll back down. So he had this eternal uh, obligation yeah, <laughs> yeah. To, to roll this heavy boulder up a mountain. And um, it just felt after a certain point that every time we felt like we were making progress on, on opening Silver Branch, something would happen and the boulder would be back at the bottom of the mountain and we'd have to start rolling it up again and then to be back at the bottom of the mountain. And so when we got to the point where we'd finally overcome all those challenges and gotten the boulder to the top of the mountain, it just felt like we had met success. But I'd like to think that I um, am not so... Uh, naive mm. as to think that the boulder was at the top of the mountain was going to stay there. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it came to brewing our very first beer, I thought Sisyphus would be the perfect name because here I am, the boulder's at the top of the mountain. I get to celebrate briefly, Yes. but tomorrow <laughs> I'm going to feel like that boulder's all the way back pushing down there and I'm starting rock, again. So, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but I, do, I do take uh, pride in each small victory of getting that boulder a little further up the mountain. Absolutely. But I uh, recognize that it'll keep rolling back to the bottom. So it's been a great metaphor for us. It's been fun. And then you tie and it back in with your second anniversary in COVID. Yeah. You know, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. We even made a limited edition uh, COVID shirt mm -hmm. where we had us uh, rolling the boulder up the mountain, but the boulder was in the, the shape coronavirus. of the COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That was so clever. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, where can people find Silver Branch online? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, things like that. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, we are uh, present on all of those platforms. Uh, it's at Silver Branch US uh, on Instagram and Twitter, and it is if you just search Silver Branch Brewing on Facebook. Um, you know, we try to we try to post a lot of fun content that's not just of the like here's this, buy it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yesterday, actually, Christian helped me with the caption because mm -hmm. I was like, 
writing a, a caption about um, the uh, Hefeweizen that came out yesterday. Right. And, uh, you know, I always take notes uh, in our marketing meetings. We'll talk about, like, kind of the stories behind a beer and, like, ways to market it in, um, you know, in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I was like, I need a beer nerd caption, you know, and yeah. I'm sure that I'm going to butcher this. And then again, since I'm the voice that you talk to mm -hmm. uh, through social media, I'm going to have to, like, defend it and <laughs> sound like I know what, you know, um, these scientific brewing very precise terms are so right. christian actually you know helped me with the caption i try to include other yeah. voices you know yeah. it needs to be the voice of silver branch which is the voice of all of us and not just me right you know and it actually brings us back to a comment you made earlier a question you asked earlier about the step mash mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is a prime example oh. of the importance of a step mash it's mm -hmm. the the caption was about how we make our hefeweizen and, and the uh the to make those the care the the Favorite characteristics in Hefeweizen, which are a combination of banana and clove, you need to get a specific chemical compound called 4-vinylguaiacol. Four four guaiacol. And um, to do that, you need to have a specific temperature rest, uh, 113 degrees, um, for 20 minutes, so that the precursors for 4 vinyl guaiacol can be created. Mm. And so you have to start mm -hmm. low, and then you bring the temperature of the mash up to your typical protein rest and then sacrification rest. Uh, so anyhow, that was the uh, that was the caption of this is about. But it, it is it is an example of why we designed a brew house that can do the step mash, the multi temperature uh, step mash. Okay. For the record, it yeah. left my own devices. I would have butchered that. <laughs> yeah. Again, um, you know, everybody, you know, everybody thrives on collaboration. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I mean, you guys near and dear to my heart. You were the uh, first people to follow me when we started our social media. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's always a nice connection. So we're going to make sure we get that up on our website at awesome. sharepointpodcast.com. Um, well, we've learned about Silver Branch. Let's get to know you both a little bit better uh, in a new segment that we call Straight from the Tap. Uh, it's a series of seven rapid fire questions. You can expand on them if you want. Otherwise, we'll just fire away. So, Christian, Aaron, if you're up for it. Sounds, yes. Sounds good. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, here we go. Straight Is this from the for tap. one of us first, or like we. However you want to do it. Okay. No, let's just both just... screen things. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> What's your favorite style of beer? Pilsner. Whatever I'm drinking. <laughs> okay, what style do you wish more people appreciated, drank, or brewed? Pilsner. Yeah. <laughs> um, coach. Ooh. Who are one or two of your biggest influences? In life or in beer? However you want to answer it. Ah. Uh, Michael Jackson. Okay. Patti Smith. I need to actually make sure that people understand the Michael Jackson I'm referring to is the Michael Jackson beer writer, ah, not yes. the Michael Jackson he, he, musician. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, things I did not know about yeah, Christian. Christian right? No, my yeah. Patti Smith is absolutely the rock star slash poet. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Okay. All right. Who would you most like to do a collab with that you haven't already worked with? I mean, I'll go ahead and answer this. Yeah. Um, my dream collab is Einstock. They're an Iceland brewery. Yes. Um, yes, oh, I, um, really I go to Iceland maybe two or three times a year, oh, of so course, pre-pandemic. Right. Uh, I've got a ton of good friends over there, and mm. I would love to share American beer with Iceland and, um, you know, go brew in Iceland. I told them. <laughs> if I'm ever able to hook this up, that they cannot leave me behind. <laughs> like, I have to go on the trip. It's on my list yeah. of places to go, so let me know. I'll hit you. I got you. I'll give oh, you awesome. all the suggestions. Awesome. I'll, say, yeah. I'll say Black Sheep uh, Brewing in Britain. Oh, okay. that's good. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, most memorable place you've ever had a beer? Uh, um, Nam Pen. Okay. How uh, PG rated does this story <laughs> have to be? <laughs> Well, no. um, we're an audience that drinks beer. No, so. I mean, honestly, um, I spent a lot of years of my life playing music. Mm -hmm. uh, I've toured the world. Um, you know, I've had, uh, actually, I mean, call back to Iceland. I've had beers uh, where the American and European tectonic plates meet wow. on a hike. Yeah, and it was cool. an Einstock, by the way. Nice. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay, what person, living or dead, would you most like to share a pint with, and what would it be a pint of? Ooh. I'm going to say Charlemagne, because one of our beers is Charlemagne's Nightmare, and I've been fascinated by the beer culture of uh, the whole Dusseldorf, Cologne region. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't think that this beer existed when he was alive, but it would be Kosh. Cool. Yeah. 
I'm going to take the easy cop out and say, whoever wants to have a beer with me? Like, I mean, <laughs> honestly. You've been listening to my podcast. That was my answer when Rob posed the question no. to me. Whoever I mean, wants to share a pint with me. Honestly, though, um, one of my favorite things about working here, um, and of course you could see like being here, you know, behind the scenes and early, we mm -hmm. all kind of set up in the tap room and you know, once the tap room opens, uh, it fills up with people mm -hmm. and it's um, really thrilling to talk to the people who want to come to Silver Branch and talk to the people who um, enjoy our beer. Um, and you know, I've, uh, I've sat at many tables uh, with our guests as cool. well as our founders, uh, investors, etc. And mm -hmm. really it's whoever wants to have a beer with me. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right, last one. When COVID is over and travel is safe again, where are you most looking forward to drinking a beer? Okay, so a friend of mine um, is, was, I don't know, if he's ever watching this, uh, he should correct me, but uh, the president of the uh, Dutch like Beer Bar Association, so mm. all of the brown cafes over there. So, okay. you know, smoke, drink Jennifer, uh, you know, <laughs> drink beer. Uh -huh. um, so anytime I'm over there, he always takes me somewhere fun, so I'm gonna say the Netherlands. Cool. Um, gosh, I'm, this is a tough one. So many places I want to go. Uh, I'm going to say um, I've been really keen on the idea of getting back to Central Europe. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say Prague. Okay. So let's shift back to the brewery and then talk about what we can expect from Silver Branch in the next few months, whether it's collabs, uh, releases, events, things like that. What's coming up? So we are finding that we are in the transition where we've so far been able to just sort of kind of throw beers at the out there mm -hmm. and i think so right now we're in a situation where we've now had two years of brewing behind us and so we've had enough recipes that we've made already that people have enjoyed that we want to make again mm -hmm. but we also want to keep being able to be innovative and, and creating new beers and so we're beginning to create take some of our beers and put them into series where they can be a little bit more intentional as to when they come out and following one on the other. And so I think what you'll see from us is a bit more of a intentional combination of, of uh, the, the, the uh, beers we were talking about, the balanced drinkable beers mm -hmm. with uh, some of the more aggressive hoppy beers and the stronger beers. And so I think people can look forward to a, 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 a sort of slightly more intentional um, you know, release structure at Silver Branch. Okay. Again, I'm, I'm an events girl. I know. Girl. This is, this yeah, is so, um, so um, you know, we want to basically do something each and every weekend. And mm -hmm. I think that you know, throughout the you know the rest of April and into May and June, we have every weekend planned out. Um, all sorts of you know fun stuff coming up. Again, the Kolsch Festival, which is a favorite of my event. Um, if yeah. you ask me if I'm great at walking with a tray of Kolsch, <laughs> the answer is no. Um, but I really enjoy. Um, I really enjoy that event again for the education piece and for just um, you know showing people how it's done in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Looking beyond that, uh, Oktoberfest, you know, because of course the first year of Oktoberfest we were fully open but brand new. Right. The second year of Oktoberfest was a COVID Oktoberfest, right. and so this year we really hope to get every single table here outside. We hope to expand all the way down the plaza here. You know, um, mm -hmm. Oktoberfest is maybe my favorite type time of year. I have a dirndl for every single day of the week, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, but again, you know, being able to throw events again, being able to bring a lot of life to the space and a lot of attention to the product that Christian and his team are creating. Right, great, yeah. right. Um, well, is there anything else that you'd like our audience to know that we haven't covered? I think the thing that I'm most excited about is to continue to putting out these incredible drinkable session beers that, uh, you know, for me are the beers that I enjoy most that we put out there. But more importantly, to combine them again with uh, events and food. You know, after a year of not being able to welcome people into Silver Branch um, the way that we had always envisioned having people here, right. the idea of being able to have people you know, back and enjoying our food and, and our beer together is, is what I'm particularly excited about this coming year. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Uh, well, again, remind everyone where they can find Silver Branch online. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, as well as silverbranchbrewing.com, um, where you can, you know, shop in our web store, which, of course, we've uh, mentioned, which, you know, is something, that, a project that I'm particularly proud that we were able to Absolutely. do. Yeah. Um, but if you're in the region, just stop in. I would love to have a beer with you. Awesome. Well, great. I mean, we'll put that up again on our website at sharepintpodcast.com. Uh, well, Christian, Aaron, I want Cheers. to thank you for your time today oh, and no. for sharing a pint with me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cheers. Prost. Share a Pint 
is released bi-weekly on Friday mornings and can be found at sharepintpodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at share underscore pint and like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. SharePoint is now a proud member of the Hopped Up Network. Enjoy the show and would like to contribute? Consider leaving a PayPal tip. You can do so at the PayPal button on our website at sharepintpodcast.com or search for us on PayPal at jerry at sharepintpodcast.com. SharePoint is made possible by help from the Community Media Center of Carroll County. Music for the show, Groundwork, provided by Kevin McLeod and can be found online at incompetech.com. Associated with the craft beer industry and have an interesting story you'd like to share on a future episode? Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at sharepinepodcast.com or email us at jerry at sharepinepodcast.com. Until the next time with Share a Pint, I'm Jerry Hollow. Prost. Prost.